Good afternoon. I'm Erica Young, Associate Director at the Lincoln Institute for the Innovations in Manufactured Housing. And welcome to our webinar, Let Manufactured Housing In, Removing Regulatory Barriers to Manufactured Housing. I will now introduce Dr. Daniel Mendelker. He's the Howard A. Stamper Professor of Law Emeritus at Washington University in St. Louis Law School. And um, Dr. Mendelker, I understand that policymakers are rethinking manufactured housing. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what's going on? Well, uh, <clears throat> yes. Uh, <clears throat> Let me start out by saying that zoning, and if you don't come away from anything else from what I've said today, zoning is a major barrier to the availability of manufactured housing as a critical affordable housing resource. Zoning is a disjointed, confused, illogical system with many moving and unrelated parts. And it is this disjointed system that, that gives local governments through zoning endless opportunities to discriminate against manufactured housing in their zoning ordinances. Of course, these discriminatory zoning ordinances are attacked in court, but the courts are biased and the courts use negative attitudes about manufactured housing to uphold zoning that discriminates against manufactured housing. Unequal treatment is extensive and is the key issue when it comes to zoning for manufactured housing. Let me repeat this. Unequal treatment is extensive and is the key issue. What local governments do is to adopt discriminatory restrictions that apply only to manufactured housing. For example, it's very common to require a roof pitch that's excessive for manufactured housing. And that manufactured housing simply can't meet, which is a way of blocking manufactured housing. So defeating, defeating unequal treatment, defeating unequal treatment is a major, is a major policy goal that should be thought about. Now, this isn't, you might say, well, the courts won't do it, so we need statutory treatment at the state level. You can do it at the local level. No, no reason why a local government can put a provision in their zoning ordinance that says that manufactured housing shall be treated equally, but it's best done at the state level. And it's simple. A simple state statute that says that no zoning regulation should be applied to manufactured housing unless it is also applied to housing that is built on the site, traditional housing. A second policy issue that should be discussed is the exclusion of manufactured housing from single family residential zones now, when you go to look at my working paper, there's a photo of a single family manufactured home right at the beginning of that working paper. And I want you to tell me if you believe that that beautiful manufactured home should be excluded from single family residential zones. But this is very common. And the exclusion, and the local governments are, are, are smart enough there usually isn't a total exclusion, but an exclusion from the most desirable residential zones where manufactured housing can be built. There is no basis for this exclusion. Nevertheless, courts uphold, courts uphold the exclusion of manufactured housing 
from single family housing districts with false claims. These are from the court opinion. This is what the courts say. Manufactured housing increases crime. It limits growth potential. It has an adverse effect on the development potential of a neighborhood. All that's in the cases. That's false. All that has been proven false. So it is very important in rethinking policy issues to allow manufactured housing and single family residential districts. Next, there's something called a special exception or conditional use. You may have heard of that. So what municipalities do, they may decide, well, we'll do this differently. We won't just exclude manufactured housing from single family districts. We'll require a special exception, which is usually required if there's some problems with the use that have to be looked at. Now, a special exception is an administrative permission under which local governments decide whether a use can be located in a single family residential district. Well, local governments decide what uses are special exceptions. Local governments decide on what criteria they're going to use for approval. So what happens? Manufactured housing is listed as a special exception in a residential zoning district. And then uh, vague standards are adopted like compatibility. The manufactured home must be compatibility, uh, compatible with the, with existing housing, must not have an effect on property values. Now these standards are proxies for exclusion. They are proxies for exclusion because the manufactured housing developer comes in for a special exception. He's denied a special exception, and the chances of overturning that in appeal are very very limited. And courts uphold the rejection of manufactured housing as a special exception with the usual bias, with the usual bias. Finally, design standards are very important. Now, the design standards can have a useful function. Good design is important. But local governments use design standards to block manufactured housing. For example, they might adopt, for example, they adopt design standards that apply only to manufactured housing. Some statutes allow that. Some state statutes allow standards that apply only to manufactured housing. And a good example is an ex a standard that uh, <clears throat> all a look-alike standard, all housing must look like other housing. Well, if there's if they're infill sites. In a subdivision that's got brick facades, you can't have manufactured housing because then they don't have brick facades. It's not defensible. It's not defensible. So the campaign and, and a statute can be passed that deals with that, prohibiting a local government from adopting design standards that prohibit or discourage manufactured housing to earn reasonable cost to delay. And all this is in my working paper. So in conclusion, the campaign for manufactured housing is a critical effort in today's fight for affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mandelker. That was really interesting. And um, I'm gonna follow up and add, uh, answer the previous question that we posted in the poll and ask that we have the second question posted um, before we go on to our next speaker. Um, the answer is yes, the most manufactured housing re is basically in either inner ring suburbs, um, sometimes in cities, and large part in terms of communities, manufactured housing communities um, are in those locations. In terms of manufactured housing units, the bulk of them are in rural areas. So it's a split. The communities, a lot of them were established, um, and then cities grew up around them. Cities and suburbs grew up around them. So, and now to our next question. 
And I'll ask you to pick that. And then in the meantime, I'm going to turn to our next speaker, Mr. Ramsey Cohen. He's Director of Industry and Community Affairs, Clayton Holmes. Ramsey. Yeah, hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm gonna uh, share with you guys a, a bit of perspective on the, uh, the industry and kind of an overview of uh, the different kind of housing products that we can, can bring to market, because I think a lot of times there can be some confusion around um, what exactly a manufactured home is. Um, a lot of times, uh, local zoning policy regulations are written in such a way that uh, reference products and product categories that don't technically exist anymore. A lot of times, you'll see mobile homes, et cetera, referenced. And um, those, you know, as I take you through this, um, those, those are just not products that we build. Um, any longer. And so uh, I do want to share a little bit about just what we do bring to market, but a little bit of an overview about Clayton. If you're unfamiliar with who we are, we're one of the larger builders in the manufactured housing space. Um, our goal, uh, our, our purpose statement is opening doors to a better life. And that's what we really focus all of our decision making and uh, actions on. We have over 20,000 team members, about 40, uh, over 40 building facilities scattered across the country. And so you know, we're, we're uniquely positioned to be able to support addressing the affordable housing need across the country, regardless of uh, really what state we're in, especially here, in, you know, at least in the contiguous uh, 48. So the history of manufactured housing really starts in the early 1900s. Uh, the famous Sears catalog, the Craftsman Homes, where you could order a prefabricated home, really was the beginning of uh, what ultimately became the current manufactured uh, housing industry. And that progressed to move forward to the 1950s and 60s, where homes really were designed to be much more mobile than they are today. Right now, uh, your average manufactured home that's produced, 95% of them do not move from the uh, first place that the home is taken to that customer's home site. Um, so but they began to grow in popularity as a affordable um, uh, option for people who were on the move in that booming post-World uh, War II economy that we experienced. Um, and and, and help support that population as well. A major inflection point for our industry was in 1976. And that's uh, when the HUD code uh, came into place. The HUD code is what we refer to as all the regulations that each of our homes are built to meet or exceed. Um, and so we have regulators from HUD in each of our facilities inspecting these homes, ensuring that they meet these certain standards for strength, durability, and energy efficiency. Um, and so that's uh, that, that ultimately was a really good thing for our industry because it forced everyone to, to build to this higher standard to ensure that the homes are going to be um, strong and resilient. Uh, and, and where we're at now is really moving into a period of time where we're, we're starting to blur the lines on what on-site and off-site construction really yield. Um, and so I think one of the challenges uh, is that current uh, zoning language is oftentimes outdated um, in, in terms of how it thinks or processes uh, off-site constructed homes, again, using a lot of the outdated and incorrect terminology, such as mobile homes. And uh, currently, zoning policy is not fully equipped to handle homes that are a blur between those two things, a traditional site-built home versus a home that was built in a facility. Um, and that's led us to one of our most recent innovations, and that's the Crossmod home. Uh, this is a home that uh, is built to specific standards as laid out by the GSEs, Fannie and Freddie, to ensure that uh, these homes are going to uh, meet quality standards that they have set forward and meet design and aesthetic standards that they've set forward. And they have a lot of um, interesting elements. And these are homes that, and I'll take you through a few photos here in a moment. These are homes that I would argue are indistinguishable from a site-built home um, once they are put on that permanent foundation and set on the land. Unless you see the process of the home arriving and being craned onto the foundation, um, or you crawl into the crawl space and you see a steel I-beam, which you know obviously you would not see on a site-built home, these are homes that you're not going to uh, be able to distinguish. They're homes that appreciate and finance just the same as site-built homes. And one of the things that Professor Mandelker mentioned earlier was um, that a lot of these uh, things claimed about manufactured housing, um, that they are uh, going to uh, depreciate in value in particular is something that just simply isn't true and doesn't pan out in the data. We published a white paper recently with uh, our partners at Next Step that showed that off-site built housing uh, appreciates at the same rate as site built housing. And so 
we really currently have for offsite built homes, we have three separate and distinct categories. That's, you know, manufactured housing. That's our core product. Probably the thing many of you picture when you think about offsite built homes or manufactured homes. And those are homes are all built to that HUD federal code. They can be placed on a ground acre, a permanent foundation. They can be limited in terms of the financing that's available to them because they're limited to manufactured housing financing, and they do have a lot of limited zoning opportunities, right? We are prevented from being able to be a solution in a number of markets where we should be, um, and that's something that I know we in the industry really pride ourselves on is that we are a uh, the single greatest source of unsubsidized affordable housing in our country, and we are uh, a market-based solution, right? A lot of times these do not require um, any kind of complicated capital stacks or processes. They are just naturally at a market rate affordable for, for most Americans. And so um, anyway, that, that moves us to a, another category, the cross-mod home that I mentioned. Um, that's a home that is still built to that federal HUD code, um, but one that does have financing available through Fannie and Freddie, through the MH Advantage or the Cho Choice Home uh, financing programs, we view this home and this uh, product as an opportunity to better challenge those zoning laws because I think there are a number of municipal leaders and folks around the country uh, who who are trying to figure this out, trying to figure out how they can help address the affordable housing problem in their area. Uh, you know, a lot of times when I travel and speak with municipal leaders, um, it's so funny that they frequently say, like, "Well, you know, here in." our city, we've got this real problem with affordable housing, but but that's true for nearly every city across the country. And so um, I think there's a lack of awareness, and this is partly on us to better communicate that we have this as a housing solution, um, that uh, CrossMod is currently zoned out. If you don't allow HUD code product or you don't allow manufactured housing, it is very likely that you are not allowing um, this, this home, this CrossMod product. Uh, the other category would be modular homes. So these are homes that are built to the International Residential Code based on where that home's going to be placed. So it meets the IRC year that that local municipality is using. Sometimes that it may or may not be as stringent as the federal HUD code. Um, it does not have as many zoning restrictions um, and its financing is uh, can be a, a little bit more traditional. The challenge with that is that these are not as easy to produce at scale because we are having to build the so many different standards. So you think about trying to keep a factory or facility um, as fine-tuned as possible to be able to produce as many homes as it can, uh, the more we can move towards towards standardization, the better it helps um, with that process. So I want to show off some of the great images of uh, neighborhoods and developments that we've done um, with that cross-mod product. And again, these are homes that I think would be very difficult to tell were built off-site. Uh, one of my favorite uh, things to share about these homes um, is that on average with our, you know, around 1,500 square foot home, two bed, uh, I'm sorry, three bed, two bath, uh, the Debris and waste from the production of that home in a facility uh, would fit into a two 30 gallon trash cans. Another great thing about manufactured housing and particularly these cross mod products is again that this not just the affordability that we can bring to the marketplace, but the speed at which we can develop and build. So these images here, um, you know, gorgeous kitchen, beautiful home that again, I think is difficult to tell was built in a facility. And uh, back to the, this blurs lines, that garage and that porch are built on site. The rest of the home is delivered complete. Um, but this is from a development where they did uh, 13 homes in 11 months. And so when you think about the speed that we're able to bring these affordable homes to market, um, that's a, that's another you know fantastic strong point that we have. And and we would we, we would hope and we would argue that we should be considered by every municipality as single family housing, because the, again, those stereotypes and stigmas about our product or our industry or our homes do not hold up when someone sits down and actually looks at that data. And another thing is that we're really focused on being able to take care of the environment and thinking about the affordability of the home, not just in the out the door retail cost of a customer to buy a new home, um, but the life of that home. And so, you know, we are, uh, you can see a number of stats here of how we work at Clayton to reduce waste. Um, but one of the things we're most proud of is that we just announced um, at the Berkshire shareholders meeting, um, of which we are a, 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 excuse me, subsidiary, 
um, is that at the beginning of next year, each of our homes will be built to be zero energy ready, uh, meaning that if a consumer were to go and uh, get solar themselves, they would be able to have little to no utility bill based on you know, the orientation of their home to the sun. And so we're, we're really focused on, on trying to bring uh, attainable uh, homes to the market that are sustainably built. And again, thinking about that holistic cost of uh, owning a home, not just that one-time cost. And so we do view zoning as one of, if not the greatest barrier to letting us be a more critical part of that housing solution. Um, we are always looking for the opportunity to partner with municipalities to help them figure out how to address um, these uh, these challenges challenges they, they might have. And I would say just the same as the HUD code um, was ultimately a positive thing for our industry, we're not fully opposed to trying to work together and meet certain aesthetic challenges and things that uh, the municipality may, you know, concerns they may have around the look um, and ensuring that it meets certain standards. But let's learn from one another. Let's meet in the middle um, so that we can help address this affordability crisis as opposed to uh, completely shutting the door and preventing us from being a solution. Um, so that's that's kind of the perspective uh, from us here in the industry. Thank you, Ramsey. That was really enlightening. And I'm glad you were able to um, visually show where manufactured housing is going. Um, I don't know if you wanted to see the poll results or Oh yes, yeah. Sorry, I should have asked that at the uh, beginning. I forgot the poll went up. Um, but yeah, I'd be I'd be curious just because it is always interesting. So yeah, that's about what that's the bell curve I'd expect to see. Um, and so for for you in the the not at all category, I hope it was very very informative. And for the somewhat, I hope um, you have better distinction on those different product categories. I think. Um, uh, to, back to the that we are blurring the lines around homes are the way homes are built. Um, you know, I often joke you wouldn't buy an Italian sports car built in a field. So why do you think about home production any differently? Um, that we we do need to think more progressively about home types, and that uh, we have such a large supply gap in our nation that there's not going to be any one solution on how to solve the problem but there are going to be a lot of different solutions. And we need to think about manufactured housing as being a critical component because you have a whole industry that is at the ready and has the capacity to help solve that supply gap issue. Great, thank you. I see a ton of questions coming in. I wanna assure you that um, after our presentations, we're gonna go into sort of a question and answer period and a discussion between our panelists and also as they answer your questions. So I'm very excited to see all of you very engaged in this. So I want to turn now to Ms. Sonia Truss. She is the director of industry and I'm sorry, she is the executive director for Yimby Law uh, and she'll be speaking to us um, about what's going on in communities. You're muted. Uh, hi, thanks for having me. I'm Sonia Trous, um, like Rhymes with House. Yes, I'm the Executive Director of Yimby Law, and our partner organization is Yimby Action. Um, and this is, I was cheering uh, when Daniel was making his his very rousing speech, actually. It's very rousing for um, the people we organize. Um, I started organizing just regular housing consumers, you know, mostly renters. And, you know, we also, of course, have homeowners in our a membership. Um, to weigh in on zoning. You know, it's not necessarily, people might not think of it as like a super sexy, like grassroots activity, but uh, there's quite a lot of community <laughs> involvement with zoning questions. Um, if you're involved in, you know, development, you see it all the time. Mostly people are coming to say no to whatever you're proposing, whether it's manufactured housing or an apartment building, or even just a new single family house. There's always people who have some reason that they don't want it to happen. Um, but in supply constrained places, you know, we started in San Francisco, but there are chapters, we have 43 chapters in 19 states now. Um, and then there are other Gimby groups that just aren't, you know, technically like part of our, our organization, but are still, you know, moving in the same direction um, in New York and in the Boston area, um, Philadelphia. Um, all of these are places where 
There are supply constraints uh, where there's a need for more housing of any type, um, although a lot of times it is or uh, infill apartment buildings. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, and also exclusionary uh, sort of exclusionary attitudes and exclusionary zoning. And the doctor also referenced that, you know, a lot of the prejudice that informs um, rules against manufactured housing, it's a lot of the same rhetoric actually against multifamily housing. Uh, this idea that uh, multifamily housing is quote, a parasite, that's from the Supreme Court ruling a um, hundred years ago, but it's still in effect today. A parasite on like the nice uh, atmosphere that a large lot single home you know community will create. Um, it's uh, it's just shocking how like blatant and wrong some of this prejudice is. So we work you know soup to nuts right when there's a specific housing development um, proposed. Uh, the chapters will organize you know community members and say yes, build this specific development. When municipalities are thinking about changing their zoning, our members will support, you know, better zoning, up zonings, more integrated zoning, you know, zoning for more different kinds of housing everywhere. So uh, something like what we're talking about here, um, where uh, manufactured housing is, you know, legalized, that's something that our members would support. Um, also at the state level, uh, our members, you know, organize and weigh in. And we have a partnership with Up for Growth. Um, which is a national uh, pro-housing organization. They work in DC and um, you know we support things that they also endorse. Uh, so you guys should all join actually, yimbiaction.org slash join um, so that you can, uh, you, know, you can see what our chapters are doing and help make chapters where we don't already have them. Um, so there's two things, I mean, in California where I happen to be based, uh, we, all, we actually already have a state law uh, that um, prohibits cities from discriminating against manufactured housing just because it's manufactured housing. So any rules about finishes or roof pitch or anything, materials, like they have to apply equally no matter how the housing, you know, is built. Um, so that's, you know, that's a great thing. We do have developers here who specialize in it. They build subdivisions, just manufactured housing. Um, you know, to deliver relatively cheaper product, although, you know, California is not such a cheap place. Um, one thing that I think, you know, one thing I think we're going to talk about here is this new HUD grant uh, to help cities have more, mm, you know, less exclusive zoning. Um, there's a couple things I think that the grant could help pay for. Um, I think the one that might be the most interesting and is something that cities have sort of been looking at pussyfooting around a little bit. This, our California State Housing Department has actually, is, there's definitely insiders that are interested in promoting this idea, um, are pre-approved plans. You know, for a city to be able to say, look at this three-story row home product. That's the kind of thing I live in now. Um, you know, or whatever it is, we have a typical, a very typical lot is a 5,000 square foot lot large lot, you know, there's just one 1500 square foot home on it. This was built in the 1940s, you know, it's all over California, all over the US, transforming those into lots that have like four houses on them um, with pre-approved plans. This is a thing that could help everyone. And uh, would, you know, if the plans are pre-approved, you could see them and manufactured housing manufacturers, you know, know what to build and design and the developer, you know, knows where it's going to land. Um, so that would be something that we'd be very excited in working on with anyone here. Let me know. Um, Cause it could be good for, good for anyone. Uh, good for, you know, the consumers, the developers and the cities. Um, that's, uh, that's all I got for now. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Sonia. That was really interesting. So um, the two grants that we're, she's referring to, we have the, the um, YIMBY grants and Yes in My Backyard grants to fund localities, tribal governments, and states to reform their exclusionary zoning and make it more inclusive. Um, the rulemaking is going on right now, uh, so feel free to comment and weigh in, maybe help your locality through organizations like 
uh, Yimby and I'm Home try to um, apply for those grants. Uh, the other one that we have is the um, Price Grant, which is also providing funding to states, localities, tribal governments, looking to, uh, and um, sorry, to tribal governments and resident owned communities and individual uh, units to try to do replacement on those older, um, often pre-1976 manufactured housing units, because sometimes it is more affordable to simply replace them with one of the new modern, high quality, high efficiency units. So those are the two grants that um, we uh, referenced in there. So I see a ton of questions. So if my, uh, my guest would kindly join us um, back online on camera, that would be great. I have a, a lot of questions here to go through. Um, the first one is, I think this one is more for you, Ramsey. Can you speak to the challenges of dirt work and development to a pad ready site um, because this is from Victoria building an MHC from the ground up is significantly less costly than site built homes as you talked about. Can you talk a little bit about the challenges between say a pad or a foundation is anyone doing pads anymore. Yeah, yeah. So there are a number and I'll, I'll be honest when it comes to the side of actual uh, doing dirt work that's not a thing I have a ton of pro you know. Uh, familiarity in. I'm, I'm more on the policy side, so I, I don't want to steer you wrong if, like, I don't want to quote numbers and costs to you, um, and that's a great question. I do know that it is oftentimes much uh, cheaper and affordable. Um, I think our biggest challenge is uh, in being able to find the right kinds of places where people want to live that are closer to those urban corridors where we would be allowed or someone would be allowed to uh, pursue the dirt work of uh, preparing a manufactured home community. I do know that um, with those communities, especially if you're doing density, you're able to move a lot faster than if you're doing a large single family subdivision with big setbacks and bigger homes um, that that just slows the process down. My understanding in terms of dirt work costs is that it's it's not a we don't have a lot of processes that save money outside of um, the efficiency of speed that you can have crews come in and take care of large number of pads or home sites. Um, at one time, which can save you save you money, um, but that you know dirt work is that horizontal work is going to be the same regardless. Our savings are really realized more on the home production side. So, you know, your cost of actually getting the home on a pad or on a a home site is going to be a lot lower with a manufactured home than site building. I hope that answers answers your question. Great, thank you. Dr. Mendelkurt, um, in your paper, you offered some concrete steps that states and localities can take to undo land use barriers of manufactured housing. From your, um, one suggestion you had was model administrative procedures. Um, could you go into a little more detail about what that is and how it would work? Uh, you're on mute. Yes, I can, and let me start by saying that zoning, there are 43,000 local governments in this country and they all zone. And zoning procedures at the local level are chaotic, they're chaotic. There's nothing in the statutes as far as decent procedures. Why is this important? Because in, in many cases, in fact, <clears throat> one of my students who, practice zoning for 40 years said he had never had a zoning project that did not require some kind of administrative procedure. Special exceptions were what I mentioned. Design review is special, is a special procedure. Uh, what happens without any any decent procedures is that the uh, the, the the zoning hearing is 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 a fluke. And the, the developer can't get up and present his or her case. There are no findings of fact. There is no discipline. There is no cross-examination. Uh, there is no final decision. And, uh, and in fact, uh, I'll tell you, let me give you a decision. I quote this in my paper. Uh, in one court case I found begins by quoting the mayor 
And this was his decision on manufactured housing. We don't want them houses there. So if you get a decent administrative procedures, and I participated with the American Planning Association in drafting a detailed administrative procedure code that's discussed in my working paper. That can be adapted at the local level. And by the way, it begins with notice. You get, you notice those who are involved. You limit the issues to be discussed at the hearing. You provide for steps in the hearing in which each party can present his or her case. You provide for findings of fact. You provide a decision. If that's done, then this kind of arbitrary decision making is going to be not nearly as common. Thank you. The American Bar Association has has published a uh, it's published uh, published a uh, a model act procedures act based on our act. I think that's all cited in my working paper. It's right there for you to use. Great. Thank you. And this will bring me to my next question, and I'm going to toss it out there to all of you because I think you probably all would have some feedback. So this is from uh, someone who said that there was uh, in Williamstown, um, where they are, they almost uh, allowed manufactured housing um, to be included. And uh, one of the objections was that they don't last as long as stick built homes and that people were concerned about waste of demolishing manu old manufactured housing. And it seemed like it, it failed, but very narrowly. Um, can, so their question is, what's a good counter to the, those arguments? Because um, they sort of smack of some of the, the bias that, that Sonia, um, that Ms. Trouse and, and, and Dr. Mandelker referred to um, in there, so. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take, take part of that one first. I think uh, some of the bias stuff, I think Sonia could probably speak to as well as others, but in terms of quality and uh, re replacement programs, I mean, one, I, I would counter that uh, if, if you're looking to replace those homes, uh, I'd want to be familiar with the age and, and quality of those homes um, as they were built. But a lot of times, if if replacement is not allowed in a community, you are forcing a homeowner into what is a, a no win situation, right? They're they're going to spend a lot of money trying to rehab this home and keep it livable, keep their utilities low, and all that. And like, it's it's going to be very difficult to get that home up to the level of quality they new manufactured home um, would be able to do. And so, you know, again, thinking about that that total cost of ownership, if if you were able to replace that home with a new manufactured home that is built to a zero energy ready standard, that home is going to, on average for a consumer, save them $70, $75 a month just on their utilities. And so um, it, I don't know that there's going to be a lot of, I mean, there is going to be some waste, yes, but you are ultimately going to be bringing in a product that is going to last a lot longer. And I think that that 30 to 50 years, my guess is that that's based off uh, the Appraisal Institute's guidelines for useful life when assessing a manufactured home. Um, I, I would argue that that's another area of opportunity for us to try to improve the perception of manufactured homes that they can last much longer. You know, These are homes being built with the same materials that you would uh, see in a site-built home. And so um, I, you know, I'd also say with those hundred year old homes, if they're not super well maintained, <clears throat> the cost of owning that home can get very pricey when thinking about, uh, the utilities and, and that sort of thing or repair costs and upkeep new homes are not going to experience that same kind of, uh, repair cost and burden. Yeah. So let me add, as I think we've all said before, manufactured housing is not built in a field. <laughs> Manufactured housing is built in a factory under strict national standards. Since 1976, there's been a national building code administered by the Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development, and no manufactured home gets built unless it uh, complies with that code, which preempts any local codes. So that in itself, I think, answers one of the concerns here what was it that manufactured home or substandard or something like that? Thank yeah, you. So, I, sorry. I would push, that's, I would push back up. So a lot of times people think 
that old things were built better, but it's a little bit of a trick. It's selection bias. The old things that were built well still survive today. They built a ton of crap in the past. It's just that it broke. I mean, and now, and you know, not every single house built a hundred years ago still exists. Like they, they built shacks, they built things that weren't so great. Um, and the other thing too, it's a little bit, there's, I can't remember the philosophical like question, but is it the same house? You know, you replace the roof in a hundred years, at least twice, or maybe three times, you know, if you are, you know, the, it has new wiring, um, maybe in California, we're constantly raising the houses up, right. They were built sort of with like a pony first floor is like seven or eight feet. People raise them up. Um, if you're in a house that's hundred years old and it's still nice, it's not a shack, it's been significantly rebuilt. So the idea that that house has lasted is like not, it's, it's not quite right. Thank you. I, I, I living in an older house, I can attest to the amount of work that we've had to do in our house. It is not the same house that it was 50 years ago. Um, so Ms. Tress, I have a question. So Dr. Mandelkrum had mentioned how helpful it is when legal support is offered for developers or potential owners of manufactured housing to overcome legal barriers to their home. Could you describe a pertinent case that your organization has worked on and some of your lessons learned on how people can approach some zoning barriers that they might face? Yes, um, I loved reading that part of uh, the doctor's paper. Um, so we exist because there are tons of state laws that are meant to protect the ultimate consumer of housing, you know, certain things, cities have to permit certain things. Um, but they were designed thinking that the developer was going to sue to enforce their rights, which does not happen. I mean, rarely, because at the end of the day, you know, you're a developer, you don't, you're trying to raise money from investors. You don't want to say, oh, I have this great project. All we have to do is sue the city. You know, that doesn't sound like a great project to investors. Um, and the other thing is, you know, you don't want to have a reputation as being litigious. Like you're going to be trying to get stuff permitted in that city again in the future. You want to be easy to work with. Uh, and yeah, lawsuits are just expensive and time consuming. Um, so when we realized this, you know, this was an outgrowth of our activism. We had been organizing people to say yes to housing at, at planning commission meetings and neighborhood meetings. And then we realized that, you know, when all of our politics failed, uh, there were state laws that that housing organizations and regular people actually had standing in California to enforce. And so that's, you know, our nonprofit. We have an in-house lawyer. We have lawyers, you know, that we hire um, externally. And when sometimes, sometimes the project the developer sues also, sometimes they don't. But if it's a project that we support um, and it's having trouble, you know, we'll sue the city. Um, and, uh, so the thing, so we are looking to expand, you know, nationwide, the biggest question is standing. So, uh, whatever laws you pass, uh, or get passed or advocate for a very important thing is to explicitly say that housing organizations is the way it works in California. It's a housing organization or anyone who could have lived in the project, which is very broad, very broad. Cause anybody could do anything. You know, you can't look at a person and be like, you would never be able to live there. Like, who knows? Um, so that's great for us. Uh, so getting that standing in there, very, very, very important. Um, so the lawsuits, you know, we most like mostly what we sue on are, are infill multifamily developments. I saw somebody was asking about uh, multi-story uh, manufactured housing. My understanding is that it is possible. It happened to not be depicted in Ramsey's um, slideshow, but it is possible. Um, there have been attempts there, you know, to do uh, modular, I think they call it, you know, partially factory built uh, apartment buildings um, here in California. Um, you know, I don't know, they work, they exist now, people live in them. Um, but since in California, you can't discriminate against modular housing, uh, we haven't encountered that. Um, but the sort of structure of the lawsuits is basically the same, like the city requires cities, I mean, sorry, the state requires cities to approve multifamily housing, you know, where it's allowed, right? Cities will just not follow their own zoning, which is baffling, but it's true. Um, our, you know, we'll put in a letter, we'll say you have to uh, approve this. And then if the city doesn't, then we sue the city. So like sometimes the city will say, 
oh, but this doesn't count as housing. For instance, in Simi Valley, there was um, basically, it was a, what many people would call a nursing home, but it wasn't, it was non-medical, you know? So it was like elder care. They had a cafeteria instead of kitchens in each unit. And the city tried to say that that wasn't, didn't count as housing. Of course it counts as housing. That's where they live. They moved out of their former place. You know, if, if the place burned down, they'd be homeless. Like they don't live anywhere else. It's not a hospital. Um, so, you know, we won on that. Um, this question of conditional use is actually going out of style in California. Uh, uh, doctor mentioned before, you know, that sometimes cities will inject subjectivity into a relatively objective process by having conditional use. That's illegal actually now. Um, if something is allowed with conditional use, according to state law, it's actually just allowed because uh, uh, cities are no longer allowed to apply um, subjective conditions. Uh, and you know the conditions for for conditional use are subjective. They're like, does it enhance the welfare of the community? What does that mean? Doesn't mean anything. Um, so we have a lawsuit in San Francisco that we basically won, and now the city is like settling. <laughs> it's so frustrating. Like we want to win at the superior court level, the first level, and then get to the appeals court and win there, so that it's really like published and broadcast. Sometimes cities will frustrate us because we'll win at the lower court and then they'll be like, let's not fight about this anymore. Uh, so that's what happened with that. Um, so yeah, our top two are, yeah, is that, you know, generally we we sue to make sure that the cities are following the laws, whether it's state or, um, you know, their own laws or the or the state laws. And uh, and yeah, this conditional use thing is uh, where we fight the conditional use whole concept. Cities love it, but it's not legal anymore. <laughs> Great. <laughs> well, thank you for that one. Um, so, uh, Mr. Cohen, are there any best practices that you see coming out of the states or localities that you would want to see copied or that you think are good best practices that other policymakers need to be looking at? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, first off, the, the all the, the rules and regulations that Sonia has mentioned in California are a huge, I think, we would be thrilled to see other states adopt these exact same policies. Um, that that really is the absolute best practice. Um, and then, you know, the other, I think, thinking, um, changing the way that they're thinking about affordable housing, um, it, that there is a path towards addressing that need um, without having to develop new programs. It is as simple as changing some of the things that Professor Mandelker lays out in his working paper um, that can help address that and to think about affordable housing as a part of your economic development. A lot of times we have communities reach out to us and say, hey, we have recruited this great new corporation. They're coming to us and they're going to create five, six thousand new jobs. And um, we don't have the we don't have anywhere for those people to live. And it's kind of uh, uh, a little bit of a, a, a dog who caught a car and doesn't know what to do with it now kind of thing. It's like, hey, maybe you should have talked to us beforehand because now we, you know, for us to be a part of this solution, you need to address X, Y, or Z in your, your zoning uh, regulations to allow us to even start to pursue that. And, and so there is a little bit of a chicken and an egg. And I think the more cities can be forward thinking about that and trying to address it before it becomes a critical need will be really, really helpful in the industry being able to pursue those, those opportunities. And, you know, looking to uh, someone in the chat had posed a question about infill and I'd answered that we did a, a project in uh, the city of New Orleans where we placed three homes. We're doing uh, a project where we're setting two cross mod homes in the Lakewood neighborhood. Uh, in Atlanta. And so I think the more we can go tell those stories so that cities can can see what's possible and what we can achieve, uh, the more likely they're going to be to update and change their laws, which will in turn create the kind of ground and opportunity for the industry to naturally step in and pursue those opportunities. Good. I muted that time. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Mandico. What about you? Do you have any localities or states that you think have done a decent job in trying to address some of their exclusionary land use and zoning uh, against manufactured housing, housing in general? Yes, Oregon. Oregon. First of all, Oregon has a law 
that says in any administrative procedure, you have to, municipality has to adopt clear and objective standards, clear and objective standards. Uh, that's gone a long way toward dealing with the, uh, the abuse that occurs in uh, condition uses in some of these other areas. And Oregon also just passed a law which prohibits, uh, which prohibits uh, arbitrary design standards for manufactured housing. They had a law that allowed that. Oregon just got rid of that. So Oregon is a state that I would look to uh, for, uh, for uh, uh, a uh, liberal approach. And I think and Maine is another. Uh, Maine has also adopted laws and uh, as well as uh, I think it's uh, uh, Nebraska adopted a, a, a very clear uh, law prohibiting une unequal treatment. The law says you shall not be treated unequally. It was that simple. So those are three states that I would mention. Great. That's uh, we've got a lot of ideas out here. If anybody is uh, here from some of these state and local governments or from planning offices, I hope um, that we can turn to. Um, I don't know how what. If you all have, I'm going to go around the, the room for a wrap up um, before we post our last uh, question and just ask you to say a few final words um, that you would want people to leave this webinar with uh, on this issue, on the zoning um, issue and uh, getting manufactured out, out there, housing out there as an affordable option. So I'll turn first to Dr. Mendelker. Yes. It is extremely important to understand the complexity of zoning. You should go to your planning department, get your zoning code, go over all of these possibilities for discrimination and obstruction that I talked about, identify them, including the lack of procedures, and then start a local campaign to get that changed. One of my suggestions is that we need a national organization that can get like like uh, Sonia's. Uh, Sonia can do this some of this work to support these local changes, and you will find model legislation in my working paper, and you will find some suggestions for tactics to get these changes made. So that's my first suggestion: learn your local zoning code, learn where the problems are, attack the problems. Thank you. Ramsey? Yeah, I, I would say that, that to, to echo Professor Mandelker, like go attack the problem. It's got, you know, zoning, while we do have some, some pathways laid out uh, in his working paper of how to address this as a state level, um, it is going to be a thousand different, you know, uh, challenges that we have to address community commu by community, municipality by municipality. There's not a magic wand we can wave to solve it. Um, hard stop. But I, I would say that, um, yeah, addressing those in the local area, uh, working to help uh, dispel myths that exist around manufactured housing, whatever the concern someone might have, I promise you, we have the data that shows that that concern or stereotype is not correct any longer. Um, and to, to reach out to us, I've seen a lot of, you know, questions and ideas about design and aesthetics and like we can achieve smaller footprints we can do urban infill we can do homes that are having more of a front load like we we can work with you to make those kinds of things happen if a certain design element is going to be critical for success in your local municipality and so um don't assume things are not possible because they weren't visually presented here in my my presentation like we want to work with communities so like reach out get in touch and let's Let's figure out how we can work together to help solve the problem. Great. Sonia? Uh, yeah, um, getting in touch with your local elected, it's pathetic, but also an opportunity how few emails they get about anything. Um, so I know that you've heard this before, but people keep telling it to you because it's true. Emailing your local electeds you can just write to them. You can write to them right now. It can be like three sentences. It doesn't have to be complicated. A lot of people really overthink it. They think they have to be a perfect expert on the issue they're emailing about. You do not. You can just say like, 
you know, I've just learned a lot about manufactured housing. Turns out it's amazing. It's a lot different than you expect. Like we should have more of it. Um, elected officials, a lot of successful elected officials don't really believe in anything. And I'm not saying that to slam them. It's just true. You know, to get elected, you have to be the kind of person that makes everyone you meet feel like you agree with them, right? Because everybody wants to meet the candidate and be like, oh, that guy's cool. You know, he's just like me. She's just like me. So that means one of the ways to be like that is to not really have strong opinions. And so that means that if you give them a talking point, you know, and they hear it a few times, it could be you, it could be your sister, and then your kid over three days. They're going to get the impression like, wow, many people are saying, but it's just your talking point. Um, so, so take your opportunities, whether it's email, you see that they're hosting like a coffee chat, office hours, whatever, go there, take a little bit of their time, monopolize their attention, get your talking point in their ear, um, and it will really go a long way. And yeah, join Yimby Action. Uh, if there's a local group, if there's not a local group, you can start one. Um, you know, you can take this sample legislation. Like I said, it's in line with what we do. So if you want to get active and uh, get it going in your community, like we're absolutely here for you. Great. Um, so Jill, can you post the last question, which ties this all together? So that brings us to the conclusion of our Innovations in Manufactured Housing um, webinar on Let Manufactured Housing In, Removing Regulatory Barriers to Manufactured Housing. I wanna thank um, wholeheartedly our participants today, Dr. Mendelker, Mr. Ramsey Cohen, and Ms. Sonia Trust. Thank you very, very much. This has been um, quite a pleasure and I hope all of our attendees have found it really useful. Thank you. <laughs>